welcome to Women in WP, a bi-monthly podcast about women who blog, design, develop, and more in the WordPress community. Welcome to Women in WP. I'm Angela Bowman. I'm Tracy Epps. And I'm Allie Nimmin. Our guest today is Meg Phillips. Meg is a mom, marketer, and web developer. Most recently, due to the COVID-19 crisis, it inspired Meg to found School Listed, the easiest way to share schoolwork on the planet. Welcome, Meg. Well, at least I say that. <laughs> I made that up. <laughs> so yeah, um, it's like uh, those big Goni's guys where they had like the best, the biggest peaches or like the biggest hamburger or whatever yeah. on the road. But no, I really do think it, or at least it's my ambition to be, right? So. Totally, totally. Well, as you know, since you told us you started binging through women in WordPress, <laughs> Um, we always like to start the episode by asking our guests how they got started in WordPress. Tell us about your journey. So I'll tell you the good and the bad. <laughs> I was a well, fairly developed PHP developer. So I um, sort of left the corporate world when I um, had my first child. And um, so I started doing PHP development. And that was early on in the conversation where Joomla was uh, I said that wrong, Joomla, it's kind of a tongue twister, isn't it, um, uh, was still a thing, and I mean, maybe it still is a thing, but WordPress is kind of more of a thing now, so, but at the time, you know, people were having all these conversations, like what was going to end up being the market leader, and um, I didn't really get into Zo Joomla, I didn't really adopt any content management system, I sort of had built my own, and I was just fine with PHP, and then um, the first time that I, I had a need in my life, to um, sort of switch gears from just doing in-house work to I, I took a job with an agency and they used WordPress. And that's when I got introduced to it. And it's funny because um, uh, they could listen to this. But anyway, um, the experience with the WordPress community is so inviting and so warm. And like, I have nothing to say horrible about anybody I've met through the WordPress community. But the guy who introduced me to WordPress was like, that guy, why he was like, your code sucks. You don't know how to use this. Like he was really, really mean. So um, that was terrible, but he was really a hard manager. And so I left that agency and went to another agency and I worked with a dear, lovely, wonderful genius marketer who I was, I was sort of in that role, the developer and she was the marketer. We made a really great team. And that's when I really fell in love with it as a tool. And I've been I've been WordPress ever since for everything. So I think one of the questions you ask is like, what do you use WordPress for? And I'm like, well, it's more appropriate to ask me what I don't use it for. Because <laughs> I really find that um, if you, you know, if you appreciate all the things you can do with a REST API, and then you just use WordPress to do what you need it to do, you know, what, what don't you do with WordPress? So that, that's sort of how I got my start. And um, everybody has great jobs and jobs they that aren't so great. So I, I moved on quickly from that one. <laughs> so, yeah. I had a very similar experience because I'm not a, I'm, but I'm more of a designer. And right. so, but, but PHP works for my brain. Like that but, makes sense to me. JavaScript, no. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I, you know, I come from a design background as well, not web design. And PHP was like, really easy for me to pick up and I think that um I think too this is gonna sound judgmental and it's not meant to be too many people think of design too esoterically because really in many ways we're technicians in so many ways right so when you design a garment you if you aren't thinking about the mechanics in the drape of the fabric or are you going to use a stretch lace? Or are you going to use a, you know, a, a rigid lace? Or, you know, is a plastic zipper appropriate or do you need a metal one? If you aren't asking these questions, then you're not a very good designer. You may have a great idea, but it's not going to execute into a garment. So um, in a lot of ways, as designers, yes, we love to be creative, but it's, it's our execution that makes us really great, right? Yeah. It's oh, funny because I say a lot of the same thing. Someone asked me on Twitter, um, actually, uh, Media Temple asked me like, oh, what do you like better, code or design? And I was like, for me, 
they are exactly the same thing. Like yeah. when I am designing, I am designing with modular accessible code in mind. Mm, right. When I am designing, then um, and I jump right into code right away to be able to like finish the design and all that stuff. Like you're right. Like it's like yeah. if you don't know how it's going to fit together, like how can you design that? Right. Yeah. Mm. And so it's funny in, in big garment companies, we split up the thought process in, into sometimes too many people and, and it gets watered down so much by the time it gets into the store that you're like, well, she had this really great conceptual idea and she had this really great technical design idea and the product developer had this really great fabric, but then all seven of our voices at the table turned out something that just, you know, was really middle of the road. So I think we also, um, our great designers, when we can develop that whole product journey too. Mm -hmm. So why am I talking all about design? Because right now I'm not in a design <laughs> role, but um. okay, once a designer, always a designer. Yeah. And it's, it's just such a good concept to think about, like making, always having form and function in mind at the same time. Like I've, I've experienced that I have the same kind of background where I started in uh, an artistic background and then I kind of went into code and now I'm doing like all this other stuff, but I always keep that in mind. Like mm -hmm. how does the form of what I'm doing complement the function of what it's supposed to do and, you know, vice versa. So I think no matter what industry you're in or no matter what specialty you have, having form and function married to each other is, is an incredible value to be able to cement and, and move forward with. So kudos to you for that, for, you know, Thanks realizing that and moving forward with that it's funny how kids and here i'm off on my tangent again but kids have this like really um inherent genius uh, at every age but so we're just having this conversation about should the boys take their bunk beds apart and you know i said to my son i was like well sometimes bunk beds have a desk underneath or some other thing so you could still have a platform bed and um, no, it goes a dunk bed and I could pull out the thing and Bo could fall in. And I'm like, a dunk bed. <laughs> like, where did we come up with this? But it's, it's to what you're saying. Like he had this idea that was like form and function. I could dunk my brother to wake him up in the morning. You know? <laughs> and you know, somewhere, somewhere, someday, some like, like board, like room full yeah. of like people are going to be like, you know, would be a good <laughs> idea. A really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> to have a dunk bed. <laughs> Silliness is uh, is also part of my signature sunniness. <laughs> so, um, so well, I want to hear about this product that you are yeah. um, uh, creating because this is very interesting to me right now. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, it's it's a passion project for me. So. Um, I have two sons and a daughter. My daughter's one, years, one year old, and so she's not in school. But my two sons are both in school, so I have a kindergartner and I have a fourth grader. And oh, Well, I guess now a first grader and a fifth grader, but let's talk about the context is COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And so I'm living this education crisis with my children, and um, – it just was really a light bulb moment for me and not only as a parent, but as a web developer and specifically a web developer in open source. Um, because whether we like to think about ourselves in that way, we are the cutting edge. We iterate faster. We work as a team. We have that diversity in, you know, we were talking before um, about genius and diversity. And one thing that open source allows us to do is include voices that have a perspective that we may never consider. So, you know, one of the things that um, I was surprised by, but in a great way, is that, um, you know, I met with... Uh, a, a friend of mine who actually, isn't it amazing the kids that you ride the bus with and then they grow up to have these like giant jobs and you're like, <laughs> I could like Facebook her and be like, hey, remember we rode the bus together? And, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and so like, I'm very honored that she took a whole hour actually. Um, and so her role is as like one of like, I think one of the few women or not just women, but people 
I should include everybody. <laughs> people in Georgia whose job it is to have like special projects. So, so she's like in education technology for the state and for her county. And you know, she said, what is this thing you said, Progressive Web App? I was like, well, you know, it's a progressive web app. And I, and I just like, you know, I just like, going. And she's like, and so like, she let me get through my whole pitch. And then she goes back and she's like, I really want you to explain to me what, what does this mean? And, you know, here's her dilemma. And I think that you guys will really appreciate this. And I don't, I don't know if you will appreciate it as much as I will, because Although I'm very light in hue, I grew up in a very diverse community um, from all perspectives, right? So we have a very rural and lower income area where I grew up. And so our county is the largest in Georgia geographically. And so of the, let's say the whole county, 20% of children in our county don't have access to broadband. There is no broadband. Wow. There's no ISP. So, you know, my girlfriend has this <laughs> county to deal with, and all of a sudden COVID happens, right? So 20% of her children, even if she wanted to, they have no broadband. And then of the other 80%, only 40% of those can afford the $10 plan, but the $10 plan doesn't support streaming. Mm -hmm. So I like, I'm not going to cry, but imagine how my girlfriend's dealing with this because these are the children we're having a conversation about, right? That they are isolated in a way that when school shuts down, it's just, it's, it is, it is not acceptable for them. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when I started talking about progressive web apps, she's like, slow down <laughs> and explain this to me. What do you mean they don't have to have a connection? And I was like, well, yeah, because it's a progressive web app. So it, it downloads, right? And then it updates. But in between time, they can work offline if there's a service worker. And, and you know, she's like, light bulbs went off, right? And I think that it's, it's easy for those of us working in open source using these tools to forget that in many industries where proprietary software is the thing, um, people don't know, right? Because these things are open source. If they're MIT licensed, they don't trickle down into necessarily the paid services as quickly as we might would imagine that they do. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a term that she never had considered. And, you know, praise the Lord. Like, I am so proud of myself because if School List it, if school list it does nothing else, she's already gotten a grant to put hotspots on school buses. So nice. if this happens again, she knows to ask for a progressive web app that her kids can go to the school bus. They can download that week's assignments. And then they can go home and use them. And because they have Chromebook for every kid, right? That's an initiative that they were um, already uh, having. And so, I mean, I feel like I've already accomplished something, even though I have like five users. <laughs> so, you know, but yeah, no. And so <clears throat> School Listed is really designed to pay attention to that collaboration and in a way that prioritizes extensibility and accessibility. So I am putting up School Listed for the data.org challenge, and I'm also entering Call for Code. And so now the whole WordPress community will know if I lose. But if I lose, I'm just one of the thousands of other developers who were brave enough to try. And, yeah. but, um, exactly. you know, with data.org, you know, what I really would love to do is address the education gap, right? And it, if we take it globally, it's over, it is really overwhelming in any context, but it's, it's extremely overwhelming on a global context. But if we take it just to the United States, you know, there's a link between socioeconomic class and the education gap. And, you know, 
we can form a lot of hypotheses about it, um, but my hypothesis is that um, if there's less, if, if lower expectations are set, children have been proven to perform to lower expectations. So if there's no mentor involved, no parent, grandparent, aunt, or uncle, if there's no one who sets high expectations for you in your life, then you don't, you don't perform to high expectations. It's very hard to do that, to, to think of yourself as an achiever if no one thinks you're ever going to achieve is like, that's like, okay, there I go again. Like, don't, right? don't make me cry. But um, what is that from uh, like my favorite movie ever, Jerry Maguire? Like, I'm not going to cry. <laughs> I had that experience. My daughter was in um, junior high, middle school, and um, there were some kids struggling in her math class, and the teacher was not a very good, um, would you say, she didn't have good classroom management skills. That mm -hmm. would be the diplomatic way to put it. So there were several um, boys who were really struggling, and they were Hispanic, and they had parents, you know, working a couple jobs, and you know, some of them couldn't read the English for the homework. And um, they, but one of the boys was failing. And I just can't even remember how I got involved. I think, oh, I know what it was. So my daughter was complaining about having a hard time in the class. And so mm -hmm. I went in to sit in on the class and see what was yeah, happening. It, and I saw yeah. what the behavior problems were. And so I took these three boys to the back of the room with me. This is seventh oh. grade math. And I sat down with these three boys and talk to them. <laughs> and I just said, hey, what's going on? You know, oh. and so we started looking at some of the homework and I brought in things like pattern blocks to teach them fractions. Yeah. And, and I really encouraged them. And I said, you know what? You guys are really smart. Sure. You know this yeah. stuff. You shouldn't be failing. You should be like doing really well. And there was one boy in particular who really was failing. And so I went into that classroom every day before I went to work. I had a full-time job. So I would go in at like 7.30 in the morning before I went to my full-time job and hang out with these, this boy. And it was often the one boy. Sometimes there'd be two. Sometimes there'd be three. They just want to hang out with me. And I'd bring in manipulatives and stuff like that. Right. And I really said, you guys get it. They just didn't have anyone at home that could take that time to sit down with them and say, you can do this. You're super smart. I know you get this. Just you got to do your homework. You got you to turn this in. If you didn't have to go to the school, imagine yeah. if you didn't have to if go I to could, the school. To mentor him, to be able to mentor them in a variety, you know, like back then we didn't even really have that kind of internet even. Right. That was a long time ago. But he ended up getting a B plus in the class. He got an award for being the most improved student. He was getting, he, they were going to flunk him the grade you know, and here he was a brilliant, really smart yeah. kid. And the whole problem was kind of classroom management and not having anyone else to just kind of help him. And that's where I feel like kids fall through the cracks. And, right. and yeah. we can't vilify teachers because they have so much going on. You know, it's a big class. Like uh, most teachers are like 30 students at least to one. So we're not even talking about the teachers not being able to manage it. It's, it's who could manage it is the question. But, you know, what I would love to see is a more collaborative approach, right? So that someone like yourself, let's say you were his neighbor, right? And then also just stuff that we know accessibility wise that maybe um, some of the more proprietary apps haven't, haven't done yet, right? So <clears throat> I'm not really aiming at being a learning management app or a, a student information system. I just want to find a way to grab all that public data decouple it from the secure data, right? And let's tell people what is due and when. It's a simple concept, but it's, it's not being done. And it's not being done in a way that's accessible. So maybe that young man had people in his life who had that been employing Watson's text to voice and automatically translating into a natural language Spanish just on the click of a button. Maybe his auntie or his uncle or his mom could have helped him with that math, right? So we have technology that can help in these situations. 
if the schools let us participate, and if we can do it in a way that is is um, thoughtful. Well, and I think one of the things that you like to to point that out, like we do have the technology, we have these tools. It requires that um, that kind of knowledge, and especially being someone that creates something, um, and so you understand the technology, you understand how these things go together, but being aware of oh, there's 20% that don't have broadband. There's another, like, there are a bunch. So in the tech world, especially if you don't start, you know, I'm in user experience. So if you start designing a product and you don't have your finger on the pulse of the users out there, you can be designing something that is like, I made this and it works great under these circumstances, but those are only, those aren't something that, is a reality for the people in my audience. So right. like understanding yeah. that is huge. It's like they say admitting admitting that you have a problem is the first step, right? If if the problem is not isn't that the first step of designing anything or building anything? It's like what are you trying to solve? Like we can't I feel like there are a lot of people sometimes who are just like, "Oh, I had a great idea for a thing and I'm just going to make it." And it's okay, well, <laughs> that's cool. That's fun for you, but like yep. find a problem <laughs> and solve it, and how right? Many like corporations we have just so throw much. a lot of money at that, you know? Like here, right, make at a, this at a thing. cool shiny thing, but I mean, I guess so right in that we have all of this power at our fingertips, right? To create these amazing things and like what can we do if we just decided, "Okay, there's a problem and how can we apply WordPress or open source or, you know, whatever it is we have to that specific problem. Like and that's, it's a that's huge how stuff problem, gets done. Right? And what's great mm-hmm. about the data.org is if you go and you take the time to watch the three webinars that they put on to like the, uh, to the challenge people to just motivate developers and, and, and data scientists, you know, they use the term wicked problem. And I love that because the education gap is a wicked problem. It's not even easy to wrap our brains around what drives. We don't know why it's there. It's not because teachers and schools are trying to educate some kid different than the other kids, right? But we can make guesses to those questions. We can take stats at it, and then we can use the scientific method to match back and say, okay, did we achieve a goal at even it, even if we tackle it, you know, 1%, then how many kids is that 1%, mm-hmm. right? Because, you know, I could take every first lady and like spell all their things, but it does take a village. So like, I'm sorry, but then also let's leave no child left behind, right? So I could go on both sides of the aisle and agree with every single one of them because I believe firmly in both of those sentiments, right? So um, on both, on both ends of the spectrum, my, um, my kindergartner, is really struggling to learn to read. And that's really hard for me, right? Because I'm that girl, right? I always did like the best in class, like it, that was me. It's very condescending to assume someone's intelligence because of their education or the circumstances they were raised in, right? So my friend I told you about, who's an educator in Georgia, and she has this very diverse district um, one of the things that she brought to my attention is that the text to voice is not only applicable in cases of a language barrier, but also in cases where grandma is the mentor and she can't read. And, and, and it, I stopped on that because um, that's hard for us to accept, right? It doesn't make grandma stupid. It makes grandma an effect of her circumstance. And she wants her grandson to succeed and she can help him do that with text to voice. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. I have raised five children and they're all adults. And, Congratulations. And I will tell you from my infinite wisdom that I have now from this experience that you're do not worry about your kindergartner reading because, yeah. because that can I, just read to your kindergartner. Make sure you're reading, 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 reading because they're building vocabulary. But you know what? It happens between first and second grade and depending on their age too, but it just happens. 
I, I had, my stepson was not into the reading thing and we were like really concerned. Then suddenly he was reading novels, like, you know, in like by third grade, it does take time for some kids. And we have this artificial sense of it has to happen on this particular schedule, Mm -hmm. but yeah, it's pretty high expectations. You know, my granddaughter was reading more in kindergarten, but she's a different kind of kid, you know? And so every kid kind of gets that thing. And sometimes they, they're kind of reading, but they don't want to let you know, or they, they're not passionate about it yet. So it does take a little bit of time, but it will happen. So don't, you know, don't worry, just just yeah. lay that one aside. I give you my blessing. But one thing I do want to ask you about is for the women and men and everyone listening to this podcast, um, can you just very basically tell us, you know, like when people run their Google Lighthouse report and they get that progressive web app score, like just in simple language, what is progressive web app? How does that apply in WordPress? And do we need to worry about that score that we get in Google Lighthouse? And how do we? Yeah, I think you need to be worrying about that Google Lighthouse score. Like you need to be thinking about that. Um, And in a short and simple answer, progressive web app is not a technology. It is a specification. So just like Big Mac indicates a certain number of ingredients on your hamburger, progressive web app indicates a certain set of standards, just like an ISO standard in engineering. So there's a web page on Google. So if you Google the progressive web app standards, you get a bullet list and it's in really simple language. And so I was able to share that link and I'll share it with you um, for you to share with your um, audience. But, um, it, you know, my educator friend, she's like, this is perfect because I can take this to a board meeting and every board member is going to understand And the light bulb is going to go off for them. So when you have a situation where um, mobile data is a concern, right, or there's not good broadband access, you want to talk about can we use a service worker? Is a React app the thing we need? But in most circumstances, just your average marketing website for WordPress, you don't you don't need to deploy that. You do need to pay attention to your Lighthouse score. And they're not all, those two things aren't, hand in hand. The one can be good without it being a progressive web app. Did I answer that good? Is that a... Yeah, yeah. I think it's just something I feel like, because I I teach SEO and I'm always running the Google Lighthouse, but I'm like, yeah, that progressive web app. So we're just, you know, I don't even know totally how to explain that. And it's not technically part of my class. And so I just kind of brush over it. But um, I... (laughs) I think Google does a great job of explaining. That's um, good to know. Explaining it themselves, and um, you know, there. I think it's about seven points, and it has to meet all seven of those to be considered a progressive web app. So it's not even. Um, it's not what you build and how you build it. It's how the browser interprets it. So the browser is going to behave differently when it encounters a website that meets all this criteria. So that's another thing to think about is that it's also sort of like in marketing, we talk about who's your audience. Well, in this case, your audience is the browser. And if you meet the standards for progressive web app, your audience is going to treat you differently. I like that. That, I mean, that explanation, Mm -hmm. like that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, And, uh, I actually, we were talking about this a little bit earlier um, because we were were talking about um, the, depending on the circumstance and like the education system today is rough because it's like, how do you write a test to test a fish, a monkey and a giraffe? Like, you know, like how well can you climb this tree? The fish is going to fail. But, you know, so with, with one of these, with, with technology these days, like I see, um, maybe it's just because I'm in tech, but I see this as like a really big opportunity if we have people like passionate like you, right? That we can say, hey, we can fix this gap because there is a huge gap 
and it's getting wider. And especially but, now that everyone is quarantined and relying, oh, we have to rely, everything's going to be online. Everything's going to be streaming. Well, now you've just widened the gap even more, like you've explained. Um, so like, I, I don't know, what, what do you, what is your um, like approach at uh, like how to create some kind yeah. of equalizer like that? I think that, <laughs> can I just use two words and like, I'm not trying to play to my audience. I swear to God, Do like, it. open source. Like yeah. we have to get this community. There's, and I don't even mean just open source in general. I'm sorry, but we need WordPress on this now. And I'm sorry to whoever is listening. I've got the, you know, cojones to share that sentiment because we are uniquely positioned to solve this issue. So I am out there at data.org. I'm out there at Call for Code simply to get this community excited about what we can do for the world. And it's going to take us because we're 38% because we're in every country because we span the whole gamut of diversity. It's only this community, in my opinion, that can solve this challenge because it's complex when we talk about it only within my home state of my little region in my little country. But let me tell you, when we take that problem and we magnify it across the globe, across culture barriers, across governmental barriers, across language barrier. The gap is wide and it's more scary, right? And a whole bunch of people in an American corporation thinking in technology can't solve that problem, right? It's only a community the size of the world that can solve that problem. So um, at the end of the day, you know, I had this awesome meeting with an IBM engineer because I was like, you know, they have mentors, they set you up, whatever. And I was like, well, kind of if you really, I was like, I'm kind of scared because I think there's all these like really genius like MIT people, you know? <laughs> and he's like, um, well, don't feel that way because if you present it as a to-do list, they will accept it as a to-do list. But if you present it as something that can change the world, right? And it's the same thing we were talking about with our kids, right? If I tell you you're an A student, you know what? You're an A student because you believe it and being an A student comes from your heart, not from your brain, right? It comes from your hard work, just like on the tennis court, or on the sailing um, arena, you know, it's in your heart, it's not in your mind, it's not in your body. And yeah, there are, you know, limitations here and there, but we're talking about the, the mass of the children in the world are, are all blessed with ability. And let's learn to celebrate those um, in diversity. And so I don't mean to keep going back to this conversation, it's just one of the things that as, I, as I'm working on this issue, and like I have. I have all these passions, right, in this particular arena, but one of those is, and particularly in the WordPress world, you know, we have learned to form cross-functional groups, right? Um, we are a cross-functional group, so if you go on to the um, five for, my brain just... Five for five or something? Yeah. You, five you, for something. Yeah. <laughs> but... Um, if you go onto that part of the WordPress.org site, you know, here's, here are the groups. Which, which option is, is your talent most effective in? And I feel like we do the opposite when we communicate with our kids, right? We tell them to sit in a classroom of people who are in the same level reading and people who are in the same um, age bracket as you. and instead of saying, okay, well, let's form a cross-functional team and work on this thing, right? And who has the talent in the reading and who has the talent in the math and who has the talent in um, empathy? And it, so that we can begin to tell children, you have value and it's different than my value, but we both have value, right? 
and um, there are technologies that they're out there, right? And I'm the uh, the call for code is an IBM project, so um, I'm talking a lot about how do we use these technologies we've developed for marketing to um, help us help teachers better connect with their students and have these conversations with their children. Like, let's do a project and let's. Um, who in the class feels like their their talent is empathy, and who in the class feels like their talent is, you know, engineering? And because um, we all have that thing, right? And when we, it it changes through our life, right? So I'm not always the empathy person, and you're not always the math person, because that changes as we mature and as we develop. And so if if we teach children to think about themselves in that way and, in, and compare without measuring, I think we can teach them to naturally migrate into cross-functional teams and, and build more interesting things. Well, and even just thinking about like that kind of removing that kind of competition, like that just makes everything like, oh, yeah, no, the collaborative versus the competitive. And this world needs more of that. And I also, I want to say, I don't apologize for you, like that, you know, we are the world, you know, speech. Um, I want to put some like inspirational music behind it because I think you're right. 30, you know, like more than a quarter of the internet. This, this, just like what you're saying is, well, as together, I bring, a, I bring value, you bring value, they bring value, and all 7,000 there bring some value, some different value there. And that's like, you're right. This, this, this uh, problem is too big and wide for a small team. So right. I fully support that. <laughs> Thank go you. Go team. I'll a lot of what you're describing, Meg, actually reminds me a lot of as far as like the way of teaching kids, like with this kind of value, child centric, independent centric mindset reminds me a lot of like the Montessori method, which is not taught everywhere. It's usually taught in more um, if, if I'm, I might be wrong about this and, and if I am, please let me know. But I believe it's taught in more expensive schools, which is. Like I, I was taught that and I went to <laughs> private school when I was small and like when I went into public school and I was like, why are we acting like monkeys throwing poop on the wall? Like what's going on? <laughs> um, you know, and it, it's totally like there's, and I, I, I love the, when I'm like, Montessori, who? Like, yeah. like, Sit down and shut up and do your work. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, it is such an interest. like, it's, it's the same thing that kind of uh, Tracy was saying about, like, you know, how do you test a monkey, a giraffe, and a, and a fish? How do we teach the global population of children when there's, like, 18,000 different teaching methods and teaching styles? And you have kids who move and go to a different school, and now they're in a different teaching style. And, like, what does that do to their little brains and the way that they think about themselves? And, you know, it's it's so hard to solve a problem like the educational system when yeah. there's problems nested within those problems nested right. within those problems. And, you know, it's I it's such a scary thing to for anyone to, to tackle. And, and, you know, I'm not. I'm not saying I can tackle it. What I, I, I honestly, what I'm but trying you to are, do you're is starting to, you're doing your I'm, part. You know, I'm trying to start the conversation to get some really smart people thinking about how as a community, we might be uniquely qualified to tackle this problem. Which in and, itself is a very big portion of this, you know, putting, to, right. to, to putting this into uh, the works. Yeah. yeah, and that's what open source is, right? Like WordPress is not one person; it is yeah. everybody doing their little bit and contributing their little bits here and there to build something greater. So uh -huh. you are tackling the problem; you are taking it on in the bit that you know how to do and the right. bit that you feel passionate about. You know, right. nobody can ask any more of you than that. Nobody can ask any more of anyone than that. Well, thank you. I I I want to go back to the, one of the questions you asked because I I think there's a technical answer to that. And let me explain, because I've done a lot of thinking about this, um, and I've done a lot of research into it. Um, if we combine some of the AI technologies um, 
natural language processing and there's another one that's like SS something something. Um, I will give you that link so some of our community can, uh, who might be smarter than me, <laughs> can actually research what it means but, uh, and help me out on my data.org proposal, which is due in five days. Um, it can analyze all of the text that any one child has ever put into the system, and then it can scrape your social media and intuit what your interests are. So without a teacher having to go, okay, well, he likes baseball and he likes hockey and, um, you know, he likes Harry Potter books. Without anybody ever having to data entry that, this system can say, okay, well, this kid's interested in fantasy, baseball, and hockey. Um, I could envision a solution where the teacher could say, for this week, we're studying the state standard for X. And this AI technology can go out and scrape learning content and match it to that student's interest. And then every student in her classroom gets served a different set of content that's going to not only teach them to read, but also speak to that excitement about reading which is what Angela was talking about in the beginning, right? Like when it clicks is when they fall in love with reading. I, I love that. And I kind of really love that you told that story because I was thinking when Angela was talking about that, I was literally thinking of really quick anecdotes. This episode's not about me, it's about you, but I'm just going to tell this story. Um, my mom at one point was tutoring two of my little cousins. They were, I think at the time they were in like fourth or fifth grade and they were really, really struggling with reading. Um, they were brothers. They are brothers. Um, and you know, they were going through the books that they were given in school and they were just absolutely like super, super struggling, not picking it up, not wanting to do it. And finally, my mom was like, well, what do you want to do? Like, what do you like? What do you, what, what would you rather be doing? And they were both really into cars. And so she went out and she got like car magazines and they sat down and they read car magazines together and I'm sure they didn't even really know what they were talking about as far as the mechanics of the cars, but they got so excited to have these car magazines that they felt like were picked out just for them. And so I totally see where that comes from. And it does totally absolutely work. And I love the idea of being able to use an AI, even if it's not like scraping their social media, but just, you know, having the kids sit down and do a little form of like, out of all these things, what are these, what, what are these things do you think are fun and have them select it, you know, and, you know, run with it that way. I think that is such a cool idea. It's so like Star Trek futuristic. No, right. Awesome. But it but makes it not, sound it's so not, much more fun for them. It's not in the future. It's here. Yeah. But yeah. it's just the, the idea of it being that like kind of automated, you know, yeah. where it just kind of pops you in with this custom, it, it reminds me of like the holodeck on the Enterprise. Yeah, right? <laughs> like it's just whatever you want to do, but it's secretly educational. And yeah. I, I've, I, I've never even like thought of that system being automated before. That's so cool. I love it. I want to like now make all of these things. Yeah, we could just talk all afternoon and it has just been the most amazing <laughs> episode, Meg. I am so excited you've been on. And I think what is amazing is this is the first time I think we've ever taken WordPress out of the box and, and really said, what, can, what else can we do with what we built with WordPress in terms of our community and our, our systems and stuff? And I think it gives me goosebumps. So I love that. I do want to... Um, do a shout out to a new podcast that I discovered called Data Femme. That's D-A-T-A-F-E-M-M-E. And they just on their July 12th episode, which was just, was that two days ago, had math against all odds. And they're talking about um, how to solve real world problems with data, its underlying concepts of reproducibility and representation for marginalized groups. So I think we could kind of you know, bring in a lot of women. Uh, women in WP is now following um, the woman who created this podcast on Twitter. I'll put that in the show notes. I'll tweet it out with you and her. Yeah. Um, check out that podcast. <laughs> yeah, get, get you on, on there. there. Oh my yeah. God. So she's, it's, it's a really cool podcast if you're a data geek and, and I, I love all this initiative and please tell our audience how they can find you and find your app and um, so it's meant to have two rails 
right now it has one. So I was very kindly, um, constru constructively advised I need to put the second L in. So <laughs> I will be doing a 301 redirect really soon. Right now it has one L, so it's um, it's meant to be schoollistit.com. Um, I am Meg Phillips 91, and I am Meg Phillips 91 everywhere, and it's not because I was born in 1991. <laughs> I wish it was, but it just is the one that Google assigned me. Um, <laughs> so Google rules our lives. Me that. It, 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 it's deep, deep meaning it's, for you. It's her agent number. She's agent 91. <laughs> it's like, it's just because, I don't know. <laughs> I think I was the 91st Meg Phillips on Google. <laughs> but, so funny. Um, yeah, so I'm Meg Phillips 91 on Twitter and on Gmail and just in WordPress on Slack. All of the different channels you'll find me. I try to stay kind of consistent to that. So um, right. it's likely you can find me on Meg Phillips 91 on whatever channel. And, and we'll I pick your brain yes. for forever <laughs> and Allie Nimmons I just want to thank you so much for being on the show today as our guest co-host since Amy couldn't be here I hope you join us many more times it'll help Thanks. us each to take a little vacation um and yeah we'll be all connecting online thank you so much thank you thank Yay. you for listening Yay. interested in being on the show sign up on our website womeninwp.com Follow us on Twitter and Instagram and join our Facebook group to have conversations with other women in WordPress.